welcome once again to our discussion of the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joining me for the discussion today are three distinguished members of the Brigham Young University Department of Ancient Scripture. To my left is Professor Victor Ludlow. Welcome, Victor. Thank you. Good to be here. Seated across the table from me is Professor Richard Draper. Welcome once again, Richard. Thank you much. And next to Brother Richard is Brother Keith, Professor Keith Wilson. Thanks for being here, Keith. You're welcome. Well, we have some exciting things to talk about today. In the sessions just previous to this, we were looking at some of the minor prophets, uh, Joel and Micah and Hosea and Amos, that were contemporary with, um, with events just prior to the time when the kingdom of Israel is going to be carried away into Syria and become the lost tribes. Now we have the privilege of coming back and looking at the historical text again. We're going to look, go back to, to, uh, to Second Kings, and we're going to look at this very section uh, dealing with the history leading up to and including um, the time when the northern kingdom will be carried away into, uh, into Assyria. Just let me, I'd like to give a little quick kind of a historical overview for our viewers so they'll kind of see where we are. This is a time in history when there's a lot of tension between the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom of Israel, largely because of a man named Jehu. Uh, as you recall, Elisha was told to, uh, to let Jehu know he was to become the new king of Israel. And Jehu knew to do that, he had to remove the current king. And so Jehu brings an end to the Amritic di dynasty by killing the king of Je Israel at the time named Jehoram. But he also at that time slew Ahaziah, who was the king of Judah. So suddenly Israel and Judah are both without kings. Well, Jehu becomes the king of Israel. And Judah has some trouble there, don't they? Some dynastic strife. Jezebel's daughter Athaliah tries to assume the throne and does for a while, but then she's removed and, and a, a man named Joash becomes the king of Judah. And we enter a period of time where Judah is actually going to have four righteous kings in a row. That doesn't happen ever <laughs> in the rest of the history of the people. So this is kind of a, a spiritual zenith, I guess we could say, for these people. Um, but it's also a time when there's tension, renewed tension again between Judah and Israel because it's the, it's the Jehu's dynasty that's on the throne and they're the ones that had killed the previous king. And so we're back at t with tension between Judah and, 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 uh, and Israel at this particular time. And so we begin with the chapter 14 today of 2 Kings. And we, it says, In the second year of Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, reigned Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. Now his father had been a good king, had reigned for 42 years, but uh, then eventually was assassinated, and his son Amaziah comes to the throne, and uh, he'll have a 29-year tenure. So here we are with, with chapter 14. It says he was a good king. It mentions the wonderful things he did. Uh, an interesting statement we're going to see over and over again, though. Uh, the author of this text is going to make the point that he was a good king. But look at verse 14. Howbeit the high places were not taken away. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, a little bit later, Hezekiah is finally going to be the one to do that. And so apparently these high places, some of them were like family shrines or regional, local kinds of shrines. Some of them may have initially, in the early occupation period, been places where Levites and others would have come and brought offerings and sacrifices. Yeah, but, the, but in the whole, by this time, they had all become corrupt pagan places of worship. I was just going to say that uh, Kings is very hard on these high places but they probably had a decent beginning. That is to say, yeah. Israel was scattered, and the Lord put, therefore, the Levites in each one of these areas, and therefore there were places of legitimate Jehovah worship. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. But with time, they start to become corrupted. So to get control over the doctrine and the liturgy and all this happening, Hezekiah will say, now the only place we'll worship is at this altar so that he can, he can get control over what's happening in the worship of Jehovah, right? Mm -hmm. But boy, what a political implication that has in the latter days. Because from then on, the, mind, the mindset is the only place you can have an altar to worship Jehovah is at Jerusalem. But before this, there, was, there were altars where you, could, where you could do Levitical ordinances outside of, of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, when the author of Kings is writing this text, those high places were all considered to be apostate. But to these kings, these righteous kings, at that time, they apparently are okay. At least semi-okay. Semi-okay. Okay. Well, Amaziah comes to the throne. He seems to be a good king, but um, he makes some mistakes, doesn't he, in uh, chapter 14. What's his big mistake? He takes on uh, Joash. Yeah. That's right. uh, yeah, I, I really like uh, uh, the, uh, what, the imagery in verse 9. And Joash, the king of Israel, sent Amaziah, the king of Judah, saying, a thistle that was in Lebanon, 
sent to a cedar that was in Lebanon saying, give thy daughter to my son to wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trod down the thistle. I mean, the image here, we got a little thistle and this towering tree. You can see which, uh, how, how the king's viewing Israel, yeah. or, uh, Judah on this one. Yeah. So he's saying, what are you trying to pick a fight for me, with me for? Yeah. And, and the, you know, my army is the beast. Uh, we will come down on and, you. And they were. I mean, verse yeah, 13, no they question. came down and uh, took the king and he came to Jerusalem, even broke down one of the walls there apparently uh, I mean this was a major victory for the northern took, yeah, kingdom even, even even took the vessels out of the temple hmm. so let me ask you this question that my students ask me all the time if if the king of, of Israel is wicked Jehoash and the king of Judah is righteous how come how come Judah's allowed to lose this war but I think the answer is in verses 26 and 27 <laughs> <laughs> for the Lord saw the affliction of Israel that was very bit bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. In other words, they really, they're, they're as powerful as they are, they're really on their own. They can't see that God's behind this whole thing, and he recognizes their weakness. And the Lord said not that he would blot out the name of Israel from under the heaven, but that he saved them by the name of Jeroboam, the son of uh, Joash. So, the, the Lord's really behind what's going on because they haven't quite committed that what deadly sin that will topple them over the edge. And there's also a matter, and this is a question that many prophets in the next century or two are going to be asking the Lord because first Israel's going to go and then Judah's going to go to Babylon. Why us? I mean, we're not more wicked than they are. Well, that's relative to accountability <laughs> and well covenants. Uh, a little bit of sin by a covenant people is condemned more by the Lord than more gross wickedness by a pagan people that haven't known of the Lord. And so that's part of the issue here as well. And I think another issue is that this is an offensive war. Uh, Amaziah is picking the fight. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he should have. Apparently not with the Lord's blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he'd f first of all gone to Edom and other places, and now he's picking on Israel, and yes, and he kind of pays the price. Yep, dearly in this case. So mm -hmm. in chapter 15, we have we go through a, a number of kings. There's a lot of, a lot of changing going on. We know that... Um, that Jehoash uh, is succeeded by his son Jeroboam, who's going to reign for 41 years. But after him comes this man, Zechariah, the last of the descendants of Jehu, who will only have six months on the throne. And then there's real change in, in Israel, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Shalom op occupies the throne for a month, and then, uh, and then he'll be succeeded by Menachem, who will, have, who will have 10 years on the throne. Meanwhile, they're much more stable over in Judah, aren't they? They're having mm -hmm. a lot longer... Uh, tenure on the throne, I think uh, partly is a reflection of, uh, of their righteousness. Um, uh, Terry, can I just, just interject? There is a fulfillment of prophecy in here that uh, we ought to note, and that is that uh, in 2 Kings 10.30, the prophet Jehu said, I think I've got that right, there will be four, gener or, yeah, four generations or four, four kings coming out uh, of, of this one king, and then that will be the end. And in verse 12 of chapter 15, this was the word of the Lord which he spake unto Jehu, saying, Thy son shall sit on the throne of Israel unto the fourth generation, and so it came to pass. Because with the death of Zacharias, uh, Zechariah, it's over. That, yeah. that dynasty oh, ends. And then things kind of stabilize here, where in the south you have this uh, Azariah uh, in chapter 15, verse 1, or Uzziah is also uh, mm -hmm. a, a way his name is. He has is a 52 year tenure. Yeah, becomes a king when he's 16 years of age. And although we don't have all the details right here in chapter 15, in verse 5 it says he was a leper. Uh, he was the one king that we remember that apparently in some kind, you know, becomes a king as a teenager, that does something for your ego that maybe isn't always good. And then apparently later on, some years later in, I don't know, I guess today we'd call it a midlife crisis, uh, he decides he needs a little bit more in his life and he wants to do the offering of the incense in the temple. And he's told, no, that's for the priests to do. Not even the Levites can do that, only the priests. But he says, I'm the king, I'll do what I want. And he goes in there to offer the incense and he becomes a leper. Now here's some irony. Here he is, the king. I mean, he's the top of the peak of the social order on the one hand, and yet he's a leper, which means he's an outcast. Mm -hmm. You touch him, you become unclean for eight days. And so 
that's got to do something for your ego. You are at the what top of the <laughs> social order, and yet you're the least at the same time. Boy, what an emotional yo-yo his life must have been there after. And it says he remained a leper for the rest of his life. So this is something he paid the price for dearly, yeah, this as, pride and say, ambition that he that, had. That's the point, is that he overstepped his bounds, and therefore the Lord punished him, not by, not by killing him, but by humbling him, which I, I imagine he would rather have died, mm -hmm. but the Lord had a lesson for him to teach, or a lesson for him to learn. In fact, Miriam and Aaron, wasn't the statement, uh, let him not be as the living dead once they contracted leprosy. Mm -hmm. The dread was so, so, so great. great. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Another really significant thing that happens here in chapter 15 is that this is the point where Israel becomes a vassal state or a part of the Assyrian Empire. We know that Assyria at the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates River there is building a big empire by conquering all the neighboring uh, states and basically saying you will pay us a huge tribute every year for the privilege of existing, mm -hmm. essentially. And that happens in the time that Menachem is, is, on, the, is on the throne. Yeah, so that's the very first stage of vassalage, but we see in these chapters they go into further stages until by the end of it they cease to exist because mm -hmm. they, Just they keep, keep rising the ire of the Assyrian kings one after another. About this time Jotham comes to the throne, another righteous king in Judah, and will reign for 16 years. Um, and it's just about this time that the kingdom to the north, Israel, decides they want to be free from being a vassal to the Assyrian Empire, right? Mm -hmm. um, Jotham will be succeeded by his son Ahaz, who uh, is not a righteous king. Mm -hmm. But about that time, the king who has inherited Assyrian vassalage, a fellow named Pekah, in, um, in Israel decides they want to rebel. And he's a rebel king. I mean, he's basically led a guerrilla insurrection and taking over the kingdom there, this Pekah. In fact, Isaiah often doesn't even mention him by name. He just calls him the son of Ramayah because he doesn't even want to mention his name. But I mean, he's, he, he was kind of the bad guy in the region at the time. So Judah is an independent nation, not part of the Assyrian uh, Empire now. Israel is part of it. And a nation just north and a little bit um, east of Judah of Israel rather, Syria is also Syria. part of it, and they form an alliance. Syria and Israel form an alliance with the idea that they're going to join their forces and win freedom from the Assyrian Empire, and then they decide they want to invite well, not no, only that, they, they need to, because if, if they're going to stop the Assyrian expansion into the area, they've got to get everybody together, because one or two or even just two countries together, they need everybody there. And the three major power brokers in the region would be Israel, Syria, and Judah. Well, the two of them are allied, but Judah refuses to join the alliance. That means the other little countries aren't going to. And so they then decide to move south and attack Judah to force Judah to join the alliance. And then that's where uh, Ahaz uh, plays a very decisive part and one that shows his, the nature of his apostasy. Uh, chapter 16, verse 7. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son, come up and save me. It, it, no crying to Jehovah. You know, but no he was invited to the to. prophets. Yes, which is a very good point. Chapter 7. Chapter right? 7, yeah, where we'll, he was we'll invited find out later. to trust in the Lord, but instead he trusts in the arm of flesh and forms yeah. a political alliance, the, saying, well, listen, they're attacking me from, from my no north, if you'll come to their north and attack him, I'll, uh, you know, I'll have some of their army diverted here. This is a prime time for you to, to conquer them, not realizing how the consequences would sweep yeah, south just, into his own kingdom. Which is something about wickedness, and that is it is so myopic and sometimes blind. He cannot see that he is going to open the door now for, for the fall of the southern kingdom as well as the northern. And boy, how his children, Hezekiah, will pay a price when he's mm -hmm. king because he sold out the people of God to the Assyrians, mm -hmm. uh, contrary to the prophet's counsel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, he's so, uh, so anxious to try and play both sides of the fence too. You know, we see while he's up there on this trip, he, he sees an altar mm -hmm. that he just becomes enamored with. He comes Pagan back an altar and has a copy of it built and put in the courtyard of the very temple dedicated to Jehovah. And takes down the brass sea. Uh, and then has the priest of Jehovah offer altar offerings upon it. Yeah. Incredible. Sells, yeah. sells off the temple artifacts and the temple uh, mm -hmm. riches. All in hopes of preserving his kingdom. And, um, you know, I've often thought that it's a good thing that Ahaz wasn't the king when the Assyrians finally do attack Judah, because today if 
we'd be talking about the 12 lost tribes instead of the 10, yeah. if he had been yeah, right. the king. Now, speaking of the 10 lost tribes, chapter 17 is, is where this really yeah, begins right. to take place. And maybe it's helpful for us to realize that Israel, the house of Israel, has been together as a group for th centuries. I mean, ever since Father Jacob started his family and then they moved him to Egypt and Moses brought him through the wilderness and they had judges and they've had kings and they've had prophets for centuries. And I mean, basically a millennium, the house of Israel has been together. But now begins the scattering. And these northern tribes are particularly of interest to us as Latter-day Saints because we identify them through a number of ways. So maybe we ought to just highlight there's at least four different directions that these northern tribes were scattered. The first group that we think of are the 10 tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, Shamanezer, who conquered the area, says he had something like 27,000 inhabitants and maybe their families that were taken. So here were tens of thousands of Israelites he took as a mass. But earlier in those earlier stages of vassalage, they had taken groups and scattered them around the Assyrian Empire. So there's already two groups. One, that spining kind of they just have moved them all over the place in their empire and then this big group right around 722 when the kingdom falls that he takes in mass and that becomes the group that later flees the assyrian empire they can't go home so they go northward so there's one group going northward one group scattered throughout assyria yeah, yeah, yeah. but not all of the israelites are cleansed out of the land some of them are still there and as we read here later in chapter 17 uh, the assyrians were bringing babylonians and other tribes from the desert and arabs and other groups in there and then they settle down and you know spring comes and cupid comes and all of this and they intermarry and their descendants are known as the samaritans, samaritans that of course carry on but we need to remember there's a fourth group very significant. As these Assyrian forces are coming from the north into Israel, there are a lot of people for various personal, political, and because reasons, and they've heard the words of the prophet about this coming invasion from the north. As the armies come from the north, they move south. And, and they become refugees in the southern kingdom. Hezekiah has to build cities and towns to handle all these refugees. And it's probably from those refugees a century later that a, a righteous man by the name of Lehi and another righteous man by the name of Ishmael. They're from the northern tribes, from the Joseph tribes that were in the north, but here they are in the south as citizens of the southern kingdom. A century earlier, their ancestors had, had moved south. So we've got Israel splitting into four groups, one going north into Asia, eventually Europe, who knows where else, one scattered throughout the, the Middle East, East. Uh -huh. one the Samaritans, of whom there are still a few hundred of them over in that region today, and then those that come and become part of Judah. And of course, a subgroup of that becomes the founders for the Book of Mormon community. So Israel, Scattered. especially these northern tribes of, of, of Joseph, the two tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh are really starting to scatter among the nations. Might, might want to point this out too, and that is though we do have quite an influx of northern people into the south at this time, there's been a lot of persecution of Jehovah, worshiper, Jehovah worshipers in the north, and therefore there's been a gradual moving of devout people in the south, That's right. which has helped, be part, helped uh, be part of the leaven that has caused the south to hang on for a That's long right. time. That's right. For over a century, since the days of Elijah and Elisha, they have these kind of religious refugees, kind of like the pilgrims, have been moving south. Yeah. yeah. Now up to chapter 17, we've had kind of parallel history. Histories. The authors talked about what's happening in Judah, what's happening in Israel, what's happening in Judah, what's happening in Israel. But after 17, it's yep. all Judah because Israel's gone. Mm -hmm. Chapter 17 reminds me a lot of the Thus We See chapters we, in the Book of Mormon, where the author just pauses and wants to make sure we got the message. So as you look through chapter 17, what are some of the messages that we ought to get out of this? Well, what one is it shows us what Israel did that was so bad, so bad, you know, what, what happened. And I'm, I'm just going to pick up one for the sake of time, verse 17. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Now, if we cross-reference that to Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12, that's where the Lord gives a specific prohibition in the days of Moses against these very things. And he says, or Moses says, that when they do this, they will forfeit their right to the land. And so here we see that prophecy being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And then verse 18, the next verse there in chapter 17, therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. And there was none left but the tribe of Judah only. 
that is as far as a single cohesive tribe. Now granted, in the southern kingdom of Judah, we need to remember we've had 10 tribes taken and scattered. How many tribes does that leave? Yeah, we've got to have at least two. Well, at least two, actually three, three. because there's uh -huh. 13 tribes. Uh -huh. And so we've got all of Judah. Simeon has already been absorbed within Judah. Mm -hmm. There are Levites that are scattered throughout. Benjamin actually was kind of cut in half between the north and mm -hmm. south. I mean, so Jerusalem, Benj yeah. the capital city of Judah, is actually a Benjamite territory city. Yeah. city. And these righteous refugees you talked about from the other tribes that have come south. But Judah is the only tribe that has maintained its tribal cohesiveness and identity. And of course, it's the name of the whole southern kingdom. So roughly speaking, we have 10 tribes in the north and three tribes in the south, but Judah's the only one that's, that's able to function. And from this point on, everyone living in Judah, regardless of their genealogy, will call themselves Yehudim, uh, uh, Judah, because Jews. for Jews. political, geographical, mm -hmm. not necessarily genealogical reasons. Lehi calls himself a Jew, though genealogically he's from Lehi. Well, just like we call yeah. ourselves Americans, even though we're not yeah. the descendants of the Portuguese navigators. So now as yeah. they talk about people, it's no longer are you Israel or Gentile, but there's a paradigm shift. From here on out, it's your Jew or Gentile. 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 Because in their mind's eye, there's no other Israelites people that around. Are Israelites around. Yeah, I like in 17 where he makes the point that these were people who were sinning in the light as well. Verse 32, 33. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves the lowest of them priests of the high places. <coughs> Verse 33. They feared the Lord and served their own gods. Verse 41. So these nations feared the Lord and they served their graven images, both their children and their children's children. Yeah, it's an amalgamated religion. They're, they're, they're combining Jehovah worship with uh, idolatry. Mm -hmm. What do you think of Hezekiah, Brother Keith? Hezekiah is one of those uh, bright lights uh, amongst the kings of Judah. Uh, he, he just seems to roll things back. He picks up on a few of the righteous before Uzziah and those, and he, he initiates reform in Judah. Uh, the writer of Kings just can't say enough good things about him. You know, he's, uh, notice, for instance, uh, um, he did that which was right in the sight of God according to all that, his, uh, that David his father did in verse 3 of uh, chapter 18. He, he jumps in, he, he, he uh, bad pun, but he kind of takes things by the horns, uh, and he, uh, he cleans up their worship. Uh, notice in verse 4, he removed the high places, he break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. It appears, it appears that they'd begun to, to worship this serpent on the, on the pole, uh, the image of Christ on the pole. They'd begun to worship it and, and lose track of the fact that it was meant to point people to the Lord. Uh, so he does, uh, uh, he, he, and there it is in verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was done like unto him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. So really a bright spot in their history. Yeah, in my estimation, maybe the greatest king, uh, because he didn't fall either. Mm -hmm. And he in Jewish faithful. history, he, uh, with Isaiah, who is the main contemporary prophet with Hezekiah, uh, it, this initiates in what in Jewish history they call the Silver Age. The gold age of their history was David and Solomon. This is the Silver Age. That is after they're rescued from the Assyrians. They go through some real trials here, both King Hezekiah with his health and, and the Judah with the Assyrian attack. But out of it comes some prosperity and some stability and new psalms and, and a great prophet and a great king. And this is kind of their Silver Age that will, will come out of this. And, and I'd like to just point out if, if Syria and Ephraim, the, t the two nations to the north, could not go, did not feel that they could defy Assyria together, wanted Israel or uh, Judah to help. Could you imagine the courage, the faith of this man who all by himself defies Assyria? He's not out making league. Just he himself is going to move or going to withstand uh, Assyria. We have, a, we have a, that account given in chapters 18 and 19 here that's just, just absolutely stirring. Hezekiah has inherited being a vassal to the Assyrian Empire. They're putting a huge tribute upon them. He gathers up the wealth that he can to pay part of it, but he doesn't have enough to pay all of it. But that's okay. He's bought himself enough time, and he begins preparing, knowing that the Assyrians are going to come with the intent of doing to Judah what they had done to, to, uh, to Babylon, or to Israel, rather, about 20 years earlier, to conquer and them to and the carry Phoenicians them away. And the and the Syrians and all these, they just think yeah. this is just another domino to fall here. And they come and they lay siege to Jerusalem and they send someone down there to try and strike fear into the hearts of the people, to, to yell up propaganda and to get the people oh, to panic. Intimidation, yeah. And, and what, does, what does King Hezekiah do? Yeah. 
calls on the calls on the prophets absolutely unyielding in the face face of this thing. Isaiah gives him counsel and comfort. Don't worry, not a soldier is going to come in the city. The king's going to go home. He's going to be assassinated by his sons. His army's going to be decimated. They're going to leave. You're going to be delivered. Trust in the Lord. He'll do it for you. You can't do it with your own soldiers and, and armaments and everything. The Lord will do it for you. Another teaching spot is that uh, Hezekiah uses the temple. He yeah. goes and he and he addresses the Lord in the temple. And what that a, prayer is powerful. Yeah, isn't it? Boy, yeah, one I mean, example of how to pray. Uh, yeah, he he spreads it before the Lord, is the way he says in uh, 19 verse 14. Uh, just a just a great example for us about the power of temples. So Hezekiah does what no other nation at that particular time was able to do. He's able to withstand an Assyrian onslaught because he could access the power of heaven. He trusted in the prophet. He turned to Jehovah didn't trust in the arm of flesh and found deliverance. Exactly right. Great message. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.